James Mazzoni Dalton. Well done, to you, yeah. AKA, nice. AKA. Well, do you know what? Funny on the pre on the patrons interview just now, when you were talking about pronoun- pronouncing your surname, I've been I have been for twenty one years since we first met, twenty years pronouncing it as Mazzoni. Oh, but then you've educated me. It's Mazzoni Dalton. <laughs> And it's definitely not mozzarella, Dalton. Well, to, to, be, to be honest with you, I think I'm even saying it wrong because uh, the Italians say it in a totally different way. Um, but it's, it's my name, you so I'll say, say it your as own name wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> my missus, <coughs> so listen to this. <coughs> it is amusing. Like, pronunciation is amusing, right? And so people listening watch. Oh, can you move it to your left for me? Sorry. In fact, no, stay with you, actually. Stay with you. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. I'll move the camera. Yeah, it's fine. No, it's fine. Sorry. Um, yeah, cool. Uh... Pronunciations is amusing, right? So, on the M40, there's a place I pronounce as, I did pronounce as Beaconsfield. And one of the things is growing up in Wales and being fucking Welsh and describing place names, I've, I realise I've got a problem with, I, have, I had a big problem, I do have sometimes still a problem with pronouncing words I see as, I think everyone does. But it was like a there was a as if it was a recurring thing, where I used to drive in as you did when we were in, in the Reg, and three para you drive up and down the A12 a lot to go places. I used to down every weekend oh, to I go home that. and then back that, up right. every on the on the Sunday. Yeah, I hate mm-hmm. it, right? But there's a bunch of place names on there that I didn't learn. I was mispronouncing <laughs> until I met I met a, my wife at the time, and my then to be wife now ex wife. I met her and then she said. How did you just say that word? How did you say that place name? And I would so, for example, Billericay. I would pronounce as Billericay. Ingate Stone, Ingatestone, Ingatestone. <laughs> I know, but it, I used it, it's because the it's just the Welsh thing. I don't know why. Beaconsfield. Oh, I used to pronounce it as that. I interviewed a guy called Johnny Ball, who is a uh, he's X Mill, awesome dude. He's the founder of. Um, Oh shit! Oh god! Forces cam, <laughs> forces campaign, campaign forces, forces campaign. Basically, basically getting, encouraging and enabling X mill into politics. Right? Really interesting what he does. And he said, "No, it's not Beaconsfield. It's Beaconsfield." Mm. I was like, "What? How do you know that? Why is that?" Oh, because I'm I'm from there. So I said to my missus, we've been pronouncing it wrong. My girlfriend, my fiance now, mm. Kate, it's not Beaconsfield, it's Beaconsfield. She went, no, it's not. I said, no, no it is. It's, it's Beaconsfield. She said, no, it's not. It's ridiculous. It's Beaconsfield. I said, Johnny Ball said it's Beaconsfield and he lives there. <laughs> He's wrong. He's wrong. She still won't have it, mate. She still won't have it. And to my missus, it's Beaconsfield, even though the people that actually live there call it Beaconsfield. Mm. That's pronunciation. Anyway, we've digressed again. I've digressed. <laughs> right. Um, tell me about the piracy, piracy story that you touched on in the patron-only interview just now. Oh, well, so, right, yeah. you went into anti-piracy for a period of time, you went on the circuit, yeah. hit anti-piracy, Civ Pop on a ship, That's it. and you got bumped. Yeah, first contact of my life. Never been in one in the military. Um, more contacts as a civilian. Uh, and the only contact I had during the anti-piracy. So, uh, yeah, it was... Uh, <laughs> a, a real experience, uh, Hugh. To be honest with you, talk it through, um, start to finish, go for so, it. So, um, if I, you're happy to, yeah, 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 sure. Um, I was on my first transit, um, and it was at a time where um, there was still a lot of sort of anti-piracy jobs about. There were companies popping up all over the place, um, very bootneck heavy. So a lot of the bootnecks got into it. Um, sort of more of the army guys went sort of land based, like the sandpit and stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> It was uh, so trying to get your foot in the door was was, was very difficult. Um, so I ended up working for a company called CPI Corinthian Protection International. It was formed by Kenny Rankin, who's ex One Para, and a lady called Natalie Kane, who was AGC warrant officer. And uh, basically, they formed this company. Uh, I'm not sure if it's still going. I uh, really don't know. But uh, they they had their finger in a lot of pies. Um, now. What they, they did, they, they obviously had their own anti-piracy um, guy, guys working in, in, in that. Uh, they had transits. But uh, they owned weapons as well that they used to lease out to less established companies. So they could just 
you had a, a lot of um w- within that that whole area um you had a lot of licenses that the credible companies had to apply for which, which would cost a lot of money the use of floating armories uh s- stuff like that to, for for holding weapons so um a lot of the companies didn't have their own weapons so i was a weapon custodian on my initial transit and i was armor on with a literally on with a, a greek security company working for a company called wide path um, so i wasn't an armor i was just a, a custodian of the weapons so i went along with the british weapons and signed them over like on a 1033 to the greek security team that were had the transit um, but they were using weapons from cpi so this is how i sort of got my foot in the door with, with cpi i started doing transits for them so we were working for wide path international and uh, I was on my first proper transit after the weapons custodian bit. And uh, we were coming down the Red Sea. We'd spent about four days hardening the vessel up, putting tiers of razor wire around, setting up fire hoses, all that sort of good jazz. And uh, yeah, um, literally, um, I was uh, on a, a bridge wing. I think it was my second watch. Um, a bridge we, wing? Yeah. The wing the, of the bridge. That's right, yeah, literally. We you know Navy speak now, don't you? you know um, speak. I'm an ugly cross-pollination here of, of the Army and the Navy now, So and, and with the the sort of anti-piracy bit. I've so. got a, a book up there called Jack Speak. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I got given it by, uh, I think it was Gav Tuat giving it out, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, label, mm. label, slang, and sort of terminology. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so if I hit any problems and I go running off while you're talking to grab that book, oh, it's because I don't know what you're talking about. It, to be honest with you, I'm still learning it. <laughs> yeah, I'm still learning it. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, I was on a bridge wing and um, we were, I was about halfway into my watch and uh, about 30 degrees relative bearing off the port side. We had these two skiffs and uh, the the skiffs were, um, you have two types of, of, of radar on, on the ship, you know, X and S band radar. And any, X and, and F. X and S band okay. radar, yeah. And um, they pretty much do two different things. But, but any any wooden hold vessel, it's very difficult for radar to pick wooden hold vessels up. So they, they can, depending on what sea state you're operating at, um, it, it, you, 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 you can see the crest of the wave break against sort of the bow of the ship. That's your, sort of the, your first combat indicator if you see. Uh, through, through your binos of, of, of the There's these skiffs, there. um, some people that have been doing it a lot longer can see the shadow. Yeah, a lot later on. I mean, we had guys on the bridge ring that were pinging skiffs at sort of eight nautical miles. You know, so which, which is, I mean, visual acuity on a really good day is about twelve nautical miles yeah, with binos. You, you know, but um, I was this was my first transit. I, w- I was still learning the ropes. I really didn't know, and we'd gone through some anti piracy drills. Um, with varied degrees of communication barrier. Uh, so it was myself, um, there's a former Royal Marine sniper that was on this four-man team and two Greeks from Wide Path International. And, uh, yeah, uh, we had a contact and, uh, you know, more, I, I didn't realise we were in a contact uh, at the time. Um, you know, we... Uh, How did they realise? Crack and thump? Uh, it was literally, uh, you, you know, I'd, I didn't realise what was going on, so I was, I was still on the bridge wing. And, uh, How did you know it came about? Uh, oh, by hearing it. Oh, you, OK. You, you know, you, you, you're hearing the, the rounds land. Uh, right. The window shattered on the bridge. Um, and literally... Um, oh, they were close I, then. I, oh, yeah, yeah. They were about 400 metres away by the time. Um, now, we had guys... We had... Uh, Normally what you do, uh, or what the teams operate on with anti-piracy, they do, if you've got a four-man team, they'll do uh, sort of, sort of um, three hours on, nine hours off. Three-man team, they'll do uh, four, uh, yeah, uh, sort of four hours on, eight hours off. And that's what they're... Really? They sort of be, yeah, that's what they'll be doing. Now, now some contracts, you'll have two armed guards up. So on a four-man team, they do six on, six off, which um, on a sort of Royal Navy ship is, is, is quite a normal watch routine, but... You, in the anti-piracy world, as a civvy, you tend to be thinking that you've been seen off with 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 some of these con- uh, with his type of contract. Yeah, Three it's un- nine off. So, so yeah, I mean, if you got mental. Uh, yeah, if you got a four-man team, you 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 have nine hours off. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah, four three hours sorry, on sorry, the sorry, yeah, sorry. yeah three three hours on the bridge ring. But anyway, we um, to get back to the story, um, <laughs> we, yeah, we had uh, um, myself and a former Royal Marine uh, who had done many transits, and uh, we were the first guys. The weapons were in the pelly cases inside the bridge. Um, 
Now, he just basically shouted at me, get down on your belt buckle, you idiot. You know, and I'm like that. I was like, literally, uh, first contact I've ever been on in my life at the age of sort of 37 years old, 38 <laughs> years old. And I, I was like, what the fuck's going on? Um, anyway, so, uh, yeah, we got into the bridge, um, opened up the pelly cases. Um, magazines were already bombed up. Um, SLRs, the old, uh, yeah, so we had some decent weapon systems on board. Um, and return fire. Um, now, uh, in... <clears throat> You've only you're pretty limited compared to the military with how many rounds you've got on board, um, but I was quite surprised how how quickly it started and how quickly it finished. The the moment that the uh, pirate attack group realised that we had the capability to Weapons return fire, fire yeah. that was when the approach stopped. Yeah. Um, now I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I started this in 2012. It was a, it was a lot fruitier back in sort of 2007 when it, when it, when it all started happening. Um, now many guys have done 40, 50, 60 transits and, and never been in a contact. Um, you know, so day one, week one, there's me gone out straight away on the first thing. And when I got onto the floating armory after the transit, uh, guys were like, in, "Yeah, oh, no." I said, "First transit, you know, first transit I'd, I'd ever been on. We had a contact." Um, so, you know, going back to what we, what we said on the earlier sort of interview, uh, for, for the patrons, it's, uh, yeah, that is me only ever contact and I'll never forget it. <laughs> uh, and it, and it happened as a civilian, not in three para, uh, not in the military. <laughs> uh, so when, when someone says, uh, you know, uh, they, you've got to, there's so many more credible people out there, you know, with so many more years, uh, especially some of the guys that have done, I never did Afghan, I never did Iraq. You know, and some of the stories that I've heard from some of them guys say, I said, wow, yeah, nothing like it. But, you know, from, from the one thing that you don't expect on, on, on your first day is, is being on, in, straight into a contact. <laughs> you know, with, with having no real baseline to draw from of a military environment where you've actually been in one apart from Northern Ireland. And all the conditioning gone. You know, yeah. you talk about, yeah. oh, I didn't realise I was in one, and you and you told you were getting your belt back on. That's just, yeah. well, you know, you went mm. from Reg to PT core to civvy and then that's it's you know it's uh we do pay lip service sometimes to i think mm. to how conditioned we were or are if you're mm. still in or, or or if you're out sometimes into behaviors and patterns and reactions definitely an example of that mm. you know arguably when you were back in the reg if that had happened and you were some circumstance you were on the bridge and you get and, and some contact going on you'd be on your belt buckle mm. you'd be opening the pelican case getting the weapons out without even being asked to do anything mm. and badgering for a command or a uh, a um, a steer onto right are we going to take these motherfuckers out yeah interesting interesting mate can we come on to what you are doing now can we talk about that yeah sure please right yeah. How on earth, at the grand old age of in your forties, <laughs> are you now part of the submarine service? Is that what you say? Yeah, I've, so, got, uh, uh, I've got dolphins up there somewhere. Decent, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's I've what had, um, I've had a submarine. They, they are still my aspirations, so I'm yet to be a fully qualified submariner. So, what's going speak, on? How are you doing that? Um, Reg well, PT Corps, Civ yeah. Pop, submarines. Yeah. Um, well, I I um, I came out of, of, of the anti piracy in 2016, uh, and the reason I did that is because we got pay cuts every year. Uh, it was a decent wage. Um, every year we got pay cuts. I started bumping off different companies. So I was working for um, SSI, um, Ambry Risk. And literally, I used to take um, they were massive companies. Dr they? Drum Kuzak, place, places, you know, uh, there were a lot of people uh, doing transits at the time. And Ambry Risk were one of the biggest companies. They they didn't pay the most, but they had the volume of transit, so you could stay out on the water. You know, where a lot of the smaller companies they would pay well, they'd fly you out from the UK. Um, they would give you one or two transits, and they'd fly you home. And that. You know, when you're when you're at home, Hugh, you're not earning. Plus, you're doing days in country uh, and from your same days as, in the sand same, pit. Yeah. You know, if you want to be non-domicile or tax exempt, you need these these days out the country. If you want to be legally non-domicile, this yeah. is it. Yeah, or we'll just fly into Dublin <laughs> and then get a ferry across to Liverpool. <laughs> or 
all these other options, which I'm not going to mention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah. So that was um, that was uh, always a, a, a problem. So, what what I used to do is, is play one off against the other just to stay out a little bit longer. So I would go out with a company like SSI. I would do a transit for them. Uh, I would then finish in Sri Lanka, uh, in Gaul, um, and then if they didn't have a, a flight. If they didn't have another transit for me, um, I, I and they offered to fly me home, I, I would say, well, I'd rather stay out. So I would just get a hotel in Gaul, and then I would contact the other maritime security company saying, look, I'm in Gaul. That saves them flying another team leader out country, which oh, saves them a lot of money. Right, yeah. However, the company that needed to repatriate me still owed me a flight. So I would then phone up Ambry Risk and say, look, I'm in Gaul, in Sri Lanka at the moment. Do you have a transit that I can I can do? Um, they would either say, yes, we've got one. Um, if you can go to our villa, we'll send the um, shipping company, yeah, the, the, the sort of uh, in the next couple of days, the, the agent will come and pick you up and, and we'll we'll do that transit. However, if Ambry Risk had a transit leaving from Muscat, SSI still owed me a flight. So I said, well, I'd like to go to Muscat. You were going to fly me back to Heathrow anyway, so I'll go to Muscat. And then I'd meet that boat at Muscat. So I'd just play one off against the other. Uh, frowned upon, uh, b- but, you know, it was... Um, frowned upon by who? Frowned upon by the companies. They wouldn't want you working for different companies. Um, Ambry Risk were pretty cool with it. Um, if they were on the receiving end of, right, we don't have to fly a team leader out to Sri Lanka. We've got a guy in country at the moment with one of our T-shirts who can just go on. Um, so I had literally everyone's SOPs. <laughs> so I had all different hard drives for whichever company I was working for because the paperwork <laughs> would change with each transit and, and how you, 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 you do your transit. So, um, yeah, um, so I just, I just bounce off. And I, I actually had quite a lot of time on the water. So I used to do nine months on, out, yeah, bef- uh, and then and sort of three months back home. And I'd always try and get home for Christmas. Um uh, it's uh, it's easier to get out at Christmas because a lot of the guys want to get back for that. So um, you know, I, I would try and get the month of December back home. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I would stay out on the water for a, a long period of time. Whether that's uh, actually doing transits on the ship, whether that's be staying on the floating armories or, or in the villas. But uh, yeah, I, I rode the I, I rode the anti piracy way for about four or five years. Oh, before a while. eventually, yeah, before. The bubble burst, and what happened? Um, forget the date, but um, we we not only were we getting pay cuts because of the type of workforce that were coming in. So when I started it, we had four man Brit teams, uh, and you know you're on four hundred pound a day. It was decent money. So you had two rates of pay with a lot of the companies. You had like a deployed rate of pay, which was you waiting in the hotel for your transit or on a, in a villa, um, and then you had your operational, which is when you're in the high risk area. Um, and then, obviously, because we, we, we started getting in Eastern Europeans, which would take less salary. Then we got Sri Lankans and Koreans. And, uh, you know, it, it was just driving the industry down. And the, the reason that I came out of it is because when you're working with the Brits, you, you know what you're getting. Um, you kind of understand the cat badges. You understand the ethos. You know, you're working. Communication's good. When you're working with a lot of the companies, that it, rather than just put boots on a bridge wing, they're, they're not looking at quality control. They're looking at, well, we've got the guy that will take, do this transit, and we can pay him $560 a month. And, so, so and they've you, got the guy that they need because the insurance company says they have to have yeah. the guy. And in reality, the risk is real fucking low. Well, the, right. the the biggest oh. problem that you got is that we, we used to do uh, we used to test fire the weapons, and it it used to be a great thing to team build with the crew, um, you know. And some of the some of the best people I worked with was a Russian crew or Ukrainian crew. These guys just zero tolerance, and they knew why you were there, and <laughs> you, you you were just basically they were unhinged. You could pretty much cut your own detail, and they were happy. Um, and we used to you know. Um, before sort of Marpole got involved, you know, uh, sort of pollution at sea, he used to chuck a 45 gallon oil drum off, off one know. of the bridges. Marpole? Rings. Marpole. Um, so it's uh, to do with uh, rubbish going into the seas, um, maritime um, rubbish going into the seas, Marpole regulations. So it's a regulation how you ditch gash uh, from the commercial sector. 
you know, it, 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 it's everyone. If, if you're a seagoing vessel, you have to abide by MARPOL regulations. Okay. And it's something that the International Maritime Organization, uh, everyone has to abide by it. Um, so it's pretty much how, how you dump your garbage at sea, what you can chuck overboard, what you can't. You know, and it's it's every year it gets more strict and more strict. So we, yeah, we used to chuck empty oil drums over when they got to about three hundred meters off the off the stern of the vessel. We used to you know uh, have a have a target practice, make sure the weapons were working. Um, the problem with those kind of things. Hang on, mm. sorry to interrupt. No, no. Right, just thinking mm. about it. It's those kind of regulations. <clears throat> Is it not the case that, and we don't have to go into this conversation because it's not what we need to talk about, but. Just thinking about it, and you've been on the ships, and you've seen, and and the story goes down. The to pl the implementation or the adherence to those regulations is entirely reliant on the company that are beholden to them, mm. and also the captain of the ship, the people on the ship, the the personnel there, because. Mm. You can't police it. No, no, you can't. The ocean's what mm. two thirds of the covers two thirds of the, of the world's like uh, surface. Mm. Is it oceans. Well, I mean, are you supposed to police that? If I go into the middle of anywhere mm. and chuck a fucking oil drum to the side, there's no other ships around for for fifty nautical miles. Is the, mm. is, the, is, the, is the, that's the horizon, isn't it? Fifty mm. nautical miles. Is uh, it? I think it's fifteen. Okay, okay. I think mm. horizon's fifteen nautical miles. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm getting away with that. Mm. Unless my ship's name or some information is on that oil drum, I I M O number something. Like I M O number is yeah. on that oil drum mm -hmm. that can identify me, and then that oil drum washes up somewhere or is found by someone mm. that has the inclination to report it or investigate it. Well, do you know? I mean, you, you, we, mad, we, we, isn't it? We, we we talk about you know we've been talking about anti piracy, and and you see these uh, if you have a look at the, the the history of Somalia, for instance. You know, they had a civil war in 91. Uh, they, they, they've never really recovered from that. They've had transitional governments. There's been a lot of um, investment going into that country. You know, one of my first contracts, I was looking after seismic survey vessels that were sort of sounding the oil bed, uh, you, you know, the, the seabed for oil. Um, and it's, it, 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 it's this, uh, yeah, but, but, you know, they had no Coast Guard or Navy. Um, to uphold their their sort of laws, so a lot of commercial trawlers used to overfish the yellowfin tuna, which was the main source um, of, of of income for the Somali. You know that they would feed their family with it. So you know it was, it was how they would live. It, it, it would be their living. Uh, so you had these um, you know commercial trawlers coming from places like China, Thailand, and they would overfish the Somali basin because it's unregulated. The, 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 there's no one upholding these laws. Um, uh, so the first form of piracy uh, very much was um, small skiffs coming out demanding um, fish back. You know, you're, you're stealing our fish. Well, we want them back. Oh, really, was it? That's the, so that's the first form of piracy. Holy shit. You, you know, if you're talking Somali-based piracy. As in modern piracy, piracy. Yeah, so, you know, um, they... They uh, they they left the nets at home. They took AKs with them instead because they could get fish easier that way. You don't actually have to work for a living. We can just go out to the commercial trawlers and we can demand a boat full of fish. Or the commercial captain's only happy they've just taken 250 tons of uh, yellowfin tuna out of the water. He's just going to go, yeah, a few fish in a skiff, not a problem. So he's just going to fill the skiff. But, you know, um, exposure to profit. Sort of planted a seed, you know. So you know, that's a very nice I wristwatch you've got. Oh, that was the origins of it. That's a that's a very nice wristwatch you got there, Captain. That's a nice laptop. In fact, Captain, we'll have your ship. And it was only until the Somalis got greedy that that raised an eyebrow from the international community. So, um, y y you know, when when you've got something like a chemical oil tanker that gets hijacked and, and taken back to Somalia. Well, if this vessel isn't underway, it costs the shipping company ten grand a day, ju just just to have that not earning, just to have that not earning. What's the cost so, coming from? Um, it, well, not only the crew, um, you know, but th this is what if uh, if a vessel is alongside. Let's say that you're in a port of call. Let's say you're in Suez, and the, and your paperwork isn't correct. Well, for that vessel to be stuck there, it, it's not earning. So it's costing the shipping company, you know, it all depends on what shipping company, what the cargo is, but you are a taxi service for whoever owns the cargo. 
So the moment that stops, you, you, you've got to have a continuous movement. You know, so your port stays have to be productive, proactive. We need to you know, get the job done, load the cargo, offload the cargo, you know, and, and, and be where we need to be. Uh, the moment you get any hindrance, you know, you're not meeting certain port regulations. Egypt is a great one. Uh, we call it Mo Marlborough Country. So, you know, as long as you've got 7,000 cigarettes to give to the customs officers, paperwork will just automatically happen. And, you know, this is what happens. I mean, I, I was amazed going through Suez Canal, you, you know, some of the the uh, corruption that there is there. And, you know, it, it was accepted corruption. And, and the shipping company would know about this. You know, you would know you'd have to do these sort of backdoor treat, backhand treaties, just to get things moving, sort of uh, move the vessel forward. That part of the world, though. Uh, people, you, and you people know, are like hearing that. It's that part yeah. of the world. But, you know, it's, uh, mm. it's um, not, that, not that the West is not corrupt. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Or the Far East is not corrupt. But that part of the world, that is the that is the culture. That it's, is it, the culture. It, it's, it's more in your face, though, Hugh. You know, it's more in your face. So they they don't try to hide it. it, it no, it yeah, is what it yeah, is. It, yeah. because it's that's the way of life. That is how that's how we do things, mm. isn't it? Yeah. You know, and you can't. Uh, <coughs> what was I uh, thinking about earlier? I was, when I was driving you, actually, I was thinking about it was a corruption that it was. I can't remember it was to do with Iraq, but I was thinking that's you can't hold it against them. Mm. When I say them, I mean those countries, those people, those, yeah. those uh, um, ethnic, ethnic, ethnicities in mm. some cases, because that's just the way it is. That's how you fucking, you know, that's how you you go about life. Mm. You know, you you have they're the rules. Oh, and this is how to get around the rules, and this is how we really do business, and mm. this is how you keep cash, cash, and. All the rest of it. And I don't think people understand it until they're travelled, until they're well travelled and they see this for their own eyes. And, you know, you, you, because, <clears throat> sorry, the, re the reason I raise the point is when you talk about, you know, how, how corrupt the Suez Canal situation is, I think people who are less travelled or don't have exposure to that kind of stuff, they would hear a story about an individual being like that and demanding a bribe. Mm. So, for example, the Port Authority the officer in charge of uh, the person who would take that bribe who's going to release the, the vessel to go to get on its way. And you would think, oh, the, the, the naive person would think, oh, well, he's a bad person for taking a bribe. He is not. He is inherently an evil person for taking a bribe. No, 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 not the case. I mean, a, a lot it's of it interesting, is, isn't it? Well, when you it, see that kind of stuff, it, it's fascinated me, and you know, I've always sort of kept an open mind mind with it. When in Rome, you know, it's uh, you, you you have your values and standards, and um, you know, you, you try not to put put your yours on other people, especially you know, in a country that's not your, your own. And um, everything I've done has always been a, a bit of an eye opener, seeing how things things work, and uh, you know, it, and again, a lot of this is is everyone else's interpretation i think the worst place i ever went to was karachi in pakistan uh, we oh, had really? port stay there and um the first thing was uh, so we you, you make your own water on board with a water maker and uh yeah they, they turn water that off the, uh, water maker water maker yeah. a water that's maker. my water hampshire maker. accent coming oh, water, <laughs> water maker yeah. so uh yeah it's uh they, they turn that off as you enter territorial waters you, you know purely because the water's so polluted there and like, like I said, all the gash they just chuck into the sea. All pull, the pull, gash the mic to, pull the mic Sorry. to you. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Pull it across. No, no. Grab the arm. Yeah, you, where you're chilling out and relaxing. Uh, and spinning. There you go. There you you go. Can, you can, yeah, there you go. Yeah. yeah right, so uh, the water maker mm. on the boat. They'll just they'll just turn that off as you went. Uh, booming through now, mate. Oh, sorry. Strength 10 now. Strength 10. They're, they'll just, uh, they'll just uh, turn that off as you went. Uh, territorial waters. And you'll, you'll notice when you're on the bridge wings that the colour of the water changes. It's amazing. It goes into more like a murky grey type of water. And uh, yeah, I couldn't wait to leave Karachi. <laughs> Did you get off? All right. Not not in Pakistan. Um, l last time I was there, I had an Indian crew. And because of the tensions between Pakistan and India, they wouldn't, they wouldn't give them shore leave and stuff like that. And I don't think if you're an Indian, you'd really want to go al alongside. Uh, so they stayed on the ship, so. What did you think of working with the Indians? <laughs> um, I worked with some very good ones. Um, so, uh, 
name drop now. Uh, one of my first experiences was a lad called Amit Nagy, and um, wow, yeah, I mean, uh, as good as any Brit. Um, he was he was Indian Special Forces, and uh, you know, I I'd, I'd had uh, some bad experience working with um, some of the Indian MSOs, and again, for they were just a number. They were just a, a set of boots on a bridge wing. Um, they, they weren't the, the same caliber that we were getting from the British teams. Um, we were just costing too much money, so they were replacing us. And you know, you can't compete with someone that lives in India uh, with regard to, you know, pay. Pay. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's all down to money. And you what know. about the cultural differences? Because the reason I ask is I've, I've worked with, I've, I've, what's it? no, not worked with. I've been around some Indians. Mm. Uh, or like we're talking two or three when I was working on the circuit in, in Iraq. Yeah. Um, and they are an interesting culture. Mm. Very interesting. They're very different, aren't they? Very different. I can only handle so many curried eggs for breakfast. <laughs> I love curried eggs. You know what I mean? Eggs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> deep fried, deep fried curried wow. eggs. Wow. Mate, they're amazing. Mm. Um, Indians, yeah. Did they, uh, when you were working with them, did they, uh, did they have the thing where they would, um, uh, sorry, if anyone can hear like screaming and shouting, we, there's rugby going on outside the studio. Uh, uh, where they would make themselves every morning vomit. They would vomit everything up. They would, as in fingers down their throat, vomit into the sink every yeah, morning. Yeah, you'd hear that in the heads on the floating armories. You'd, you'd hear that Apparently for cleansing. <laughs> it was for cleansing the body. Honking. Or what? Is that <laughs> yeah. what were they doing? Uh, well, that what? Uh, to be honest, it, we, yeah, it, yeah, it happened. Um we we had our own heads, so what they had on the floating armories was almost segregation. So the Brits would have our own ablutions, the Indians would have their ablutions, just because we would kick off. I mean, we were in a communal area, we were eating, and one of the guys, we had a load of fre fresh, which was rare, um, on one of the floating armories. Um, we had some bread rolls, oh. and one of the guys had been to the heads, reached across... And Indian grabbed guys. one of the bread rolls, yeah, literally. Oh, yeah, 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 so his hands oh, were no. still wet. Oh, no. And you got that whiff of shit oh, no. from his lack of personal hygiene. And I was just like, oh, yeah, disgusted with it. And um, yeah, I just mentioned that. I said, have you washed your hands? <laughs> I said, not just a sprinkling of water. Have you used hot water and soap to wash your hands? Um, and it's just small things like that. It goes back to the cultural thing. Mm. And they get taken advantage of, 100%. They, yeah. they get exploited because of it. Mm. You know, I mean, you, what you can't say is that, that you know, that, ex that experience where you had there, you are judging him based on your understanding and acceptance of a level of hygiene that you grew up in in the UK, right? Which is fucking is far and beyond mm. what it is in India. Mm. You can't argue with that. Um, it doesn't make you... Right or wrong? No. Right. Um, but they, they do get exploited. I worked on a massive contract in Iraq. Huge, 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 huge. And uh, one I wish to forget for many, many reasons. But there were, there was a big construction project going on. I worked on there in the security capacity. Mm. There were in the region of four to 5,000 Indian workers right there were uh, no 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 no. in the region of four to five thousand workers a huge proportion were indian a huge proportion were iraqi and when i come back to the exploitation part the company that was running a construction project the uh, household name should we say household name like uh even now yeah household name household name and Me, as a white Western dude working there, would get access to, well, there were two different uh, defects, so uh, dining facilities. You had the one for this company's head shed, or not the company, actually, the actual com the employees directly working for the company, and it was a small one. You could house maybe, you could have maybe... F 50, 75 people dining in there at any one time. And then you had other dining facilities which were like reg slop houses, you know, back in the day. They could hold in them, 
in a region of 500 to 1,000 people eating at any one time. And there was two of these. One was for the Indians, one was for the Iraqis. They were both exactly the same. They got treated exactly the same inside. The food was dished out exactly the same. But they were separated because, <laughs> because of dramas, because of the cultural differences between those two. Um, they shut off the DFAC access for um, Westerners, and we had to go and use the Iraqi or the Indian DFAC because the company was not of Western origin. Its household name company was not a UK or American or Canadian or European company, right? Uh, long story short, back to the point of being exploited. The workers, so we're talking the temperature out there in Iraq in we were uh, southern area. Well, I don't. I just don't want to. I don't want to give too much away in terms of. I don't want to just fucking because it was drama. Um, well, you know Iraq. It was forty, fifty, as high as fifty odd degrees centigrade in the daytime, and these were construction workers working outside all day. Those Iraqis and those Indians. Their their entitlement to water each day. What they because they'd go out there, they'd be living on camp in fucking slums, like multiple bunks in a fucking tent, essentially, which may or may not have working aircon. They'd get given three meals a day. One would be a takeaway where they'd have a a lunchbox to go out with. They would collect it in the morning and they go out with their water entitlement. Working even at the height of summer, which would regularly be more than fifty degrees centigrade was one litre of water a day mm. in the form of two 500 milliliter bottles. Now, for people listening and think, well, well that, that's a well, 500 milliliter bottle of water. That's one of those little bottles you get at the garage when you go and fill up your car. They would get two of those a day. Yeah, sure. Mental. <laughs> crazy. Crazy. Like, absolutely crazy. And there would be riots regularly on camp. The camp was like a five-mile perimeter. It was huge. Mm. It was huge. And it would be constantly riots when the Iraqis or the Indians would be in their defac at dinner time, because it would happen at the end of the day. It would never happen in the morning, because they were happy to get the food and have a fucking job still. They didn't have an option to go home. They couldn't just leave, because if they wanted to leave, then they'd have to get a visa signed off by the company so they could and then book a flight, and then get transport from the camp to the airport, which was Basra, to leave. They couldn't just leave. They're literally like prisoners. They're like mm. prisoners, like uh, like communism. I mean, <clears throat> it was like communism. Um, but there would be riots regularly of an evening. And when I say riots, I mean fucking riots to the point where the security teams who were there, which I was part of, would have hickory sticks, mate, riot gear. And they would be, and, and the riots would happen when the when one of the workers would have the balls or the audacity to either try and steal extra water from the fridges in the dining facilities or um, complain about it, mm. and everyone would kick off because one mm. one person would ask or steal, they get caught, and everyone would kick off and go in with a bucket of water, one liter a day, fifty odd degrees. When we were when I was up when I when we were work, when we were going work in wherever in the Middle East, it'd be like uh, in the military. 12 litres, I recall, was the guided minimum, minimum a day that you should have when you're like working in an arduous environment, 12 litres. And these fuckers were getting half a litre a day, completely exploited, mm. completely exploited. You know, and it, it, probably exactly the same in the ships, I'm guessing. Well, uh, you know, the the closest sort of I've been to that part of the world was Fijera or um, you know, the, that sort of area. So the, the UAE. Um, so they had the, a lot of floating armories off the coast of Fijera, um, about 26 nautical miles, which uh, you know the, a lot of the people didn't agree with. Um, Why is that? Just because there were so many of them. Um, so uh, just sort of, there was a, a guy in Fijera called Mr. Rashed. Mr. Rashed was like a self-appointed Sikh. Uh, Sikh, I'm sorry, um, uh, like a, uh, what do they call that? Not a Sikh, sorry. Sheikh. A Sheikh, sorry. Yeah, a self-appointed sheikh. So he was married into the, the sort of the UAE royal family, if you like. Um, uh, but he he had a floating armory called the El Nada Platform. Um, so basically, they were the only people that could get replens out of Fajera. 
convenient for him on his really? bank balance. Really? So if you wanted to, um, <laughs> you know, get your security team into Vajera, through Vajera, then you had to go on the motor vessel, you know, the the uh, El Nada platform. Um, now, let's say that you had um, the other companies still operate out there because this is where the ships wanted to meet. They come out to the Persian Gulf. Vajera was just a good location to pick up their security detail. Now, um, Sharjah was your next port of call, which was right round the uh, Strait of Hormuz, Hormuz. And it was down there. So you'd had to go around that little sort of crook of Omar, a tiny little bit of Omar. But that points out. At the top, yeah, yeah just yeah. sort of, and, and come around. But that was two-day transit on some of the worst vessels I've been on on the line. So, yeah, if you come out of Sharjah, um, you go you go all the way around that, and then you'd hit your floating armory two days later. Or you could go through the port of Vajera as long as you went onto the El Nada platform. When you say worst vessels, right, what was a good <laughs> vessel? Like, ideal vessel that you've been on, what was the, what was the best? Uh, what, floating armories? Yeah. Oh, so um, I'd say motor vessel Lillian was the worst. Um, the stuff, the some of the Ambry Risk vessels were were better. So, what's a good vessel? Uh, a good vessel is anything with Wi-Fi. <laughs> 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 that that raises you morale. You get a dome of pleasure, uh, and you know, and you're like that. And but again, that can dome have dome of pleasure. The dome of pleasure. So, if you have a look on a commercial vessel, you will have a, a, a dome, just a round sphere. Oh yeah. Well, that that's internet. Oh yeah, in so, my sat. In Marsat. Um, Any of them in Marsat? Yeah, but you, this like is it. In Marsat, in Marsat C. So, all all of it, so yeah. in Marsat plug, my employer, all of the vessels <laughs> you go on, you know, you hit that big Mayday button. Yeah. Big Mayday button that enables that That's everyone it. gets notified in Marsat. That's it. Shout out to in Marsat, my employer. Yeah. In Marsat yes. C. But shameless plug. Oh Not yeah. that listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> they listen to this and getting sacked. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. Yeah, okay, so that's a good vessel. You get so Wi-Fi. yeah, you got, you got the Dome of Pleasure. Uh, however, on floating armories, that is a it, it, it's a catch twenty two. Single so man rooms? A, oh no, no. I mean, I when I went on, we had this uh, vessel called the Sea Patrol, and the Sea Patrol was a nineteen fifty two wooden hold, wooden hold um, mine warfare ship built in Germany. Um, and what was really interesting, we were in a twelve man cabin. And I was on the bottom rack, and the space was literally someone's ass was in my face. And oh, the best thing about it, I woke up and I had this yellow stain from one of the urinal pipes <laughs> that was above my bunk. What space. a yellow stain in your chest? Yeah, piss stain on oh my chest, my mate, God. from 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 sleeping there. Piss dripping on you. It was the... horrible, and I wonder where that was coming from. And yeah, you sort of. T- Oh Christ! You knew exactly what it was. Oh no! And then the heads no, were directly no. above. Yeah, uh, so, uh, cockroaches. That was that was that was just a common thing. Um, rodents. Uh, some of them you'd you'd have rats. Um, but you know, uh, thankfully they were the motor vessel Lillian was probably the worst thing I ever went on. Uh, Why? We, what? What was so bad about it? No fresh water, apart from drinking water. So you were showering in a forty-five gallon drum um, with seawater. That was your shower. Oh my god! Yeah, so you were washing. What do you mean? What just chipping it over your head with a yeah, bucket? Yeah, just with the jug. So it was a, it was a it was a barrel of water, a barrel of water, barrel yeah. of sea water. Yeah. And you have to tip it over you. Yeah, that was your shower. What the fuck? Yeah, and they were. Um, I was trying to think which companies were using it. I mean, uh, was it sea sea guards or sea marshals or something they were called? And that was their that was their common thing, you know. And uh, yeah, it was substandard accommodation by far. But it was yeah, it was a, the the whole industry was a real eye opener. I mean, we some of the the best vessels I ever worked on were called Torm. Uh, they were a Dutch company, and uh, wow! If you ever got those vessels, it was like a gift. oh really? Wow! I well, mean, were they new? Were they? Well, just at European standards. Oh, it okay. was just sort of you got on there. You know, you walked into your cabin, you had Dove soap for God's sake. You know, and you're like, right. So you've come off a floating armory like that, straight into one end of the spectrum to the other, and you're like, you know, you're like a pop star or something. It's it, it, it is it, it's barking mad. Barking mad, but I think I think the worst uh, sort of answering your question, the worst vessel I ever did was a um, tug and tow, which is where they're. Uh, it's a small tug that is towing an accommodation platform for the oil and gas industry into the Persian Gulf, and they always come through Sri Lanka, so we pick it up. But these things only do about four knots on a good oh. day, so it takes a long time. It took me about eighteen days to get to Fajera, um, and this was during the southwest monsoon. So some of the sea state was really challenging. And uh, we went on with a four-man team. And the majority of the team were bedded, bedded down with seasickness. 
that's how bad it was. I mean, there, there was no piracy threat just because of the sea state. It was yeah. just they were never gonna, you know, there, there weren't any pirate attack groups operating. And to be honest with you, when I did that transit, a lot of the the last sort of pirate attack group activity off the coast of India it had dwindled by, by that point. Uh, you know, a lot of the stuff was all, already in the Gulf of Aden. A lot of the the, the sort of pirate attack groups, a lot of the int that was coming out. We, you know, the team leaders used to get in. You'd see your local pirate attack group activity um, with intel reports from all the different maritime security ink company, yeah, in in cells, if you like. So you, you, you knew where people were operating. Uh, so you know, if you had any transits uh, from Sri Lanka up to up to Fajera, you, you're pretty safe. It's you know uh, that that wasn't the case early on, but you know, the majority of uh, if that happens but the southwestern monsoon as long as you can handle the sea state it was safe because anything above sort of sea state four or five it's unlikely you're going to get um any approaches or mm. pirate attack groups operating in sea states like that before we run out of time i want to ask you about yomp upon oh yeah sure and uh after i've been to the toilet <coughs> in the toilet you're right yeah i'm good you mean you know you got a pint and a half there. yeah i can't multitask give me two seconds Right, so you're with them. Yeah. Camera, so you're with them. I've got a question. You ask Reg, why on earth is it Yompathon? Why is it not Tabathon? Tabathon was taken. <laughs> <laughs> is that why? <right>? Yeah. <laughs> Go on. That, that easy. So, um, uh, Ed Hargreaves, you interviewed him earlier. Um, I think it was one of your podcasts, 147. He was 147, I yes. think. Yeah, well done for remembering so that I listened, one. I listened to Ed. Uh, um, I've uh, yeah always had a lot of time for Ed. Uh, we were in the PT call together. Um, Ed, come up to battalion just a little bit after me. Now, listen, you've knocked that camera with you. Sorry, well, are we still talking. Talking. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, um, Ed is one of the sponsors for the Ompathon with his uh, Warrior Strong coffee. Yeah. And uh, he's also um, been very kind enough to support us with the Carrymore Thor SF Bergens, so that we oh. can w okay. we can do that event. Um, so yeah, um, there's none in country at the moment, um, but Ed's uh, Ed sourcing these for us for our first promo event um, in uh, in March, in the first weekend of March. Right, talk with three on the topic. So um, I've been involved uh, in, in charity events, uh, Hugh, to be honest with you. Um, I've done most of the, I'm not predominantly a runner, but I, I do running events. Um, I've done majority of, of, of marathons in the UK, starting off with the first one in 2001, being the London Marathon when it was run by Flora, the Flora London Marathon. Um, that was back in the day, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really was. Yeah. So that was my first marathon. Um, you know, obviously being a paratrooper, um, I, I was very proud of my uh, heritage, if you like. And uh, never, I was never really into running before the paras, and it just seemed to be what we what we did. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, we you always used to go out on runs. Um, and after what, after being in the paras for a while, you know, you sort of uh, develop that type of fitness where running was uh, part of your day-to-day, -day, your bread and butter sort of fizz. Um, so, so, you know, it just, uh, it's something that I just cracked on. I started off with the Fleet Half Marathon um, in Hampshire, and I've done quite well at that. And, uh, you know, and then I just thought, well, you know, let's go a little bit further this time. That wasn't really too much of a problem. Um, so we do the, the Flora uh, London Marathon in 2001. And uh, I did that, I got uh, three hours and one minute my my first 26.2 mile how licked were you that you didn't um, do, break the three hours i've how? never broke it hugh and oh, it's uh, something that's a bone of contention with me <laughs> uh because what's worse about the london is the last two mile you can actually see the clock in the distance oh really see, so you can see as you come around the corner 250 something you're like oh christ does that make it harder for the finish i don't know uh, i just i mean i was i was going balls out uh, you, you know, I uh, very much, you, you know, when I when I first got into the PT Corps, you had all these really smart guys with a, a wealth of knowledge. And I was just going from a, reason, a reasonably fit paratrooper. You, you know, I was, I, I was quite fit at what I did. Uh, you know, I was in A company, I was a PTI. And when I went on PT Corps selection, 
you know, I was going down with a, a 752 mile and a half thinking I'm a fit guy. I'm going to smash these people. And, um, it was a very humbling experience um, when I went on PT course selection to come in last with with 7.56. Jesus. And I was the last one across the line. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, uh, thinking I was a really fit, coming from, you know, uh, elite infantry unit um, to then get smashed by someone in the raw signals. Uh, you know, I was like, oh, my God. And these are these are the fittest guys, you, you know, um, that you never know what you're going to get with the PT core. You get your cross country gurus, you get your bodybuilders, you get your um, your jack of all trades. Now, um, part of when we were doing our selection, we had to do something called performance, which was gymnastics. And I'll tell you now, Hugh, performance, 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 performance. Yeah. So it's like uh, vaulting, balance, strength, um, <laughs> floor work. <laughs> so um i'll tell you something now 16 stone paratroopers don't do flick flacks or bent back lifts or somersaults well it's just something we just don't do we 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 tab everywhere you, you know we run everywhere we tab everywhere. that's that's our bread and butter. that's what we do uh so i came down and um i remember being in a line and uh the warrant officer there said right show me your best um vaulting <coughs> A vaulting never, being, a vaulting describe being a, what vaulting is. Okay, so you've got a gymnastic box, a box in front of you with a beat board or a, a trampette. And you go up and you do your um, gymnastic ability, uh, a performance, you know, show us what you've got. So um, I'm about, there's about 16 guys on, 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 on this selection and uh, PT course selection. And I'm about 14th in the queue. Now, unbeknown to me, there's a guy called um, Stevie Baker. And if Steve's listened to us, he'll remember this and he'll be pissing himself. So Steve was an ex-GB uh, gymnast. <laughs> um, now, um, he was an under-21 twen uh, or whatever G GB gymnast. And, and this guy was a bit of a legend. I've always uh, thought of him as a cracking PTI. So Stevie come across and he'd done um, a flick flack. And it was it was oh, textbook, and it was it was oh wow! And I look, just looked at this coming from free power, I haven't done none of this stuff, <laughs> and I was just like, wow, that was good, good. <laughs> um, now, um, when it was come, to, then you had someone that done something quite equally good, and and they they were all of, to a very high standard. It came to me, and I did something called a jump on, jump off, which any gymnast knows is the very. It's what you would get in a in a, a little taster session if you went down to a gymnastics club for the first time. Go on, what is it? You run up, you jump onto the beat board, you oh. land two footed landing onto the vaulting box, and yeah. you jump off and do a forward roll. <laughs> it's called a jump on, jump off. And he thought I was taking the piss. Uh, and I clearly wasn't. That was the best thing I had going at the time. <laughs> um, so I, I found PT call selection really difficult. Uh, but what it, it did allow me to do was meet a lot of people that were very good in different areas. Um, and I'll tell you where I'm going with this year. So going back to the marathon. Go where you running. want. Go where you want with it. So um, yeah, um, I got a lot of uh, I got a lot of uh, training done with Steve. Steve was massively into his running. <coughs> this is me. Steve Baker. Stevie Baker, yeah. 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 Um, I, I think he's he, he's out now. I'm not sure what Steve is doing, but uh, last time I saw him was in Flick about flaxer. 2000, yeah, 2005, something like that. But yeah, very good PTI. Um, I think he came from a Royal Fusiliers background Steve beforehand. Steve Baker, yeah. I know a Steve Baker, but I don't yeah. get him. But uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've I've always had um, you know I first met him on, on selection. We were on probation as what they call uh, the PT core um, nine month course where your your probs they call it probs, and um, you know uh, we 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 built a very good relationship together while we were on that. Yeah, you know, he he had boxers and and I bought a boxer off him uh, years ago, which is a, a, another dit in itself. But yeah, uh, oh dog, you mean? Uh, yeah, 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 a little yeah. boxer dog. And uh, yeah, so uh, but you know he he got me into running long distance. Um, I then did the marathon de Sables, um on off the back of that, and uh, that was a uh, my first desert marathon. I forgot you did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, do, do you know? Oh four, remember? oh six, oh four. Um, well, I've done I've done it a couple of years consecutively. So I did it initially in the Reg, 
um, and didn't get a very good result. Uh, I was, do you remember Brian Adji? So, uh, Brian initially, Adji. Uh, initially, me and Brian Adji were, yes. were going to do it. And I'm not sure what happened, but uh, Brian was, he was dicked with something else uh, at the time in battalion. And, you know, he'd gone, he'd done a lot of hard work and he'd raised a lot of sort of money for it. Uh, uh, but it was, what it was, year was it? I, 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 I don't know. Yeah, I think, I think it was 2001. 2002. Now I tell you why. 2002, and it was April because I got, I got married, um, the that year, and I had I got a bite from a sandfly, out there, and um, I had a, a I got bedded down in the MRS in Colchester with this oh, blood yeah. infection. So you know, like a a, a, a bot fly or a tetsy fly. These uh, these sandflies. I I was sleeping on the desert floor. Uh, a lot of people were in hammocks, and uh, the, the, the sand flies they don't actually fly; they just jump to about a meter off the floor. And it bit me in the throat. And what, what it did, it laid eggs in my lymphatic system, and obviously it spread throughout my body. So when you sweat, they came out as in like cysts or boils, oh block your pores of your skin. And uh, I felt like Sigourney Weaver because they're little embryos, like maggots, under you. You can see them moving. A bit um, like scabies, horrendous. Like, a bit like scabies in a way, like, yeah. horrendous. Um, so I remember being uh, having this. Uh, I got married on the twenty seventh of, of 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 April, and uh, I come back from the marathon de Sablis in two thousand and two uh, that year, and uh, I had this sort of Sigourney Weaver lump on my throat, and on your number one's uniform, you could see this. So yeah, you know, I was like, oh my god, this looks horrendous. It was like a, a second head coming out of my throat. Uh, yeah, you know, on your wedding day with all the photographs going on and everything else. So, yeah, I, I remember that vividly. <coughs> but uh, yeah, so um, yeah, um, I did the marathon to Sablis. I did the Jordan Desert Run, which is a hundred mile, in two thousand and three. Um, then went more PT core, um, uh, and then uh, I've just been doing ultra marathons ever since. Did the Comrades Marathon in South Africa. I've. Um, I uh, was very fortunate to be involved in, in, in the Gumpathon, which was with Mark Ormrod, as mentioned earlier, which uh, saw us um, running from New York to L.A. to raise money for amputees. Um, and I've always uh, liked raising um, funds for, for, for worthy causes. Um, now, what's brought me to the, the Gumpathon? is um I, I if you're raising money for charity it's you know um you see a lot of people do lands enter john O'Groats, um stuff that's been done before I, I wanted to do something different something that hadn't been done um and when people talk about oh, i wanted to focus on mental health issues because it seems you know it, it, it's that one thing that very often supersedes the physical injury um, we were very highly focused when we were getting amputees from Afghan, um, being in the PT Corps, having friends as ERIs, working in Headley Court and stuff like that. I was sort of exposed yeah, to ERI? um, uh, rehab, okay. rehab instructors. So in, in the PT Corps, you can branch off. You've got guys like Ed Hargreaves, who was an ATI, Adventurous Training Instructor. I was mainstream, so I would go down to field units and run their gym for them. You, you then had the what we call skin rubbers, the guys that went and did the rehab side of things. Skin, skin rubbers. rubbers, yeah, just rub people's skin. <laughs> skin <laughs> rubbers. So uh, yeah, but the former centre of excellence, Headley Court, was where a lot of the rehab was was going on. Um, I didn't realise. <coughs> I, I didn't realise that you said there that a lot of the um, a lot of that uh, uh, so a part of the workforce there or the rehab force mm. there came from. The PT core, I didn't realise that. Yeah, so um, ER or oh. RIs, they used to be called RIs now, oh, ERIs. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, he's uh, they um, Damon Godfrey, uh, one of the good friends of mine. He's one of the team members on the Yompathon. He is now a, a qualified paramedic uh, down oh. in Plymouth, um, and and you know he is representing the uh, the ambulance service uh, or task the the ambulance staff charity. Um, on, on the Yompathon. Now, um, what the Yompathon is, it's a military march. Um, and it's it, it's a 3,863-mile three, um, march around the United Kingdom, visiting over 200 military and emergency service establishments to raise money and awareness for post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health issues attributed 
to service life, um, both for serving members of the armed forces and emergency services, veterans, um, to support the individuals, the families, and the, and, and the wider service community. Um, now, the we have eight charity b beneficiaries that we that we have. Um, so we have uh, First Light Trust, which are a very uh, local-based sort of charity. They have hubs throughout the United Kingdom. Um, and uh, their CEO, uh, Dorinda Wolf murray ha is a, an angel in my book. She is, uh, I'm very new to charity work, and she has been a sounding board for me. Um, and um, she is that person that will just keep me on, on the straight and narrow What's her when I'm doing things. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know a, a great deal about Dorinda, but she is the CEO of, of First Light Trust. First Light Trust are... Um, the first time I heard of them was through Alan Farmer. Alan's an ex-Falklands veteran. He's an ex-Royal Marine, um, or former Royal Marine, should I say? And uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, he 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 supports local charities. And this was one of the charities when I initially told Alan about what I wanted to do with the Omphthon that he he put forward. Um, I then spoke to um, the local representative that then put me on to Dorinda Wolf Murray later on and uh yeah we've uh, we have a very good rapport now and uh yeah um when you get into the work of charity um uh, the Omphthon started out Hugh as as a, as a charity event um and I'm glad to say we are actually now a new registered charity with the charities commission ah, congratulations. so two days ago we got our charity registration number congratulations <coughs> and the reason I can pick up it by the way sorry that's right Jesus the reason that we we did that is purely because um, I just thought, well, there was a lot of sort of politics within the different charities that we were raising money for. And I just thought, well, you know, I, I want to do it my way. How hard can it be to have your own charity? Um, so I looked into it. And, uh, you know, I've, uh, I, again, <coughs> there's still, a, excuse me, <coughs> there's still a lot of work to do. But uh, like I said, we, we are, are a registered charity now. Um, now, the Omphthon itself, it's, um, we have a 12-man uh, team, if you like. Um, we have a uh, Royal Marine, uh, soldier, sailor, airman, uh, paramedic, police officer, and a firefighter. So they are the Yompers. Uh, we also have five lovely support staff that have come from either the emergency services or uh, veterans of the armed forces. Um, the event starts on the 30th of September. And it starts at the oldest military establishment in the United Kingdom, which is Whale Island in Portsmouth, which is home of the Royal Navy and home of uh, Royal Navy headquarters. What's the base called? Whale Island. It's called Whale Island. Yeah, Whale so Island. Oh, HMS Excellence. H there we go. That's asking you. Okay. Oh. <coughs> so that's where the event is start and finishing from. Okay. And it's a continuous relay. So each person will do the old school CFT. So they do eight mile <coughs> carrying a Bergen weighing 25 kg. Uh, once they get to, the, uh, they'll be averaging a pace of 15 minute miles. They will then hand that Bergen over to the ne next team representative who will just crack on. The Bergen will never stop moving. And we're doing a complete relay around the country, visiting over 200 military and emergency service establishments. Where to finish? Finishes on the 10th of November, just where, before where, where? Whale Island. Same. In the same place, yeah. Wait, that's a fucking beast. It is, yeah. So each each jumper will be doing um, 16 mile a day, broken down into two CFTs, two eight milers. How do you sign up? <coughs> how do you sign up for a leg? Oh my God. Okay, You've so got, you're coughing and I've got hiccups. <coughs> it's oh my right, God. Yeah. This is shocking. <laughs> uh, how do you sign up? I'm going to try and cough up. Uh, mm. Hiccup off my the thing is, you can cough off, Mike, because you know a cough's coming. With a hiccup, I don't know it's coming. <laughs> Literally. I mean, like this. Oh, Christ. Um, how does one sign up for a leg? Okay, so it's not a matter of signing up, but we are looking into doing something like this, you. Um, it's very much chicken and the egg. Uh, you know, what do we do first? We're still looking for, like, support vehicles. We've still got to open up a bank account before we can start taking donations. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff that we still need to do. What we're looking at is like challenge coins um, where people can raise, say, £200. 
using a sponsor form, they can then say, well, you know, we'll sign up for this leg. Now, what we have to be very careful of here is the amount of numbers that we're doing it because of the areas that we're marching through. So as long as we have <clears throat> small numbers, we don't have to apply for local governments, local councils, permission to go through it like a charity event. So if you're doing it like a marathon, like for the masses, where you've got road closures and stuff like that, you have to get certain permissions. This obviously takes time. Where you've got one guy yomping, just cuts all the red tape. Have you got, the whole, have you got the whole route done? Oh yeah. So if you go volunteers, to, yeah, oh, volunteers. Um, no, no. So it's not it's not volunteers. So we've got a twelve man team. That will be the team that we'll be going through, and we've got seven yompers. Right. So the reason I asked, mm. oh, stupid hiccups. The reason I asked is, um, I was thinking, oh, if I could possibly be involved, mm. how would I go go about stupid hiccups? Go about doing one of the legs. Oh, so and other people will be thinking mm. that too. So when uh, it's it's like it's cool what you do it. Mm. If I hiccup again, I'm gonna break. Um, so that's that's what I was asking. So um, go on. Yep. So uh, what we're looking at doing is creating some challenge coins, where you get a challenge coin for doing a leg. Now you can do an eight miler with one of the representatives of the Yompathon team. The way that you do that is that you fill out um, one of our um, application forms or sponsor forms. You source your own sponsors. Okay, to the sum of two hundred pounds. So basically, you're sponsoring your leg. Yeah, that then gets donated to Yompathon. You then come on the leg. You get a nice challenge coin at the end of it. All proceeds go towards the eight um, charities, service-based charities. So I, I mentioned um, First Light Trust as being one of the beneficiaries. Um, they support local veterans within the community. Um, we have another one which isn't registered with the charity's mission called All Call Signs run by a guy called SJ SJ is uh, All ex, Call uh, Signs as in all the All signs. Call Signs that does the Peer support we're looking group. for this person that's right yeah um, which is the the beacon <coughs> there beacon the, alerts the yeah. beacon alerts and SJ fantastic guy and when I started uh, doing <coughs> this stuff he, he was very helpful with regards to the website because he was like a software engineer before he was in the military so a lot of the stuff, uh, SJ helped me out massively. So in, in, in debt to the guy, to be honest with you. But um, yeah, so we, we, we're, obviously, uh, we, we're raising money for all, all call signs as well. Um, SAFA. Um, okay, so we, we're raising funds for SAFA. Um, TASC, the Firefighters Charity, Police Care. Um, so what, what also makes the, the offer uniform quite unique? Uniform personnel. All uniform personnel, yeah. That, that's, that's who we're raising money for. Sounds good, mate. It's really good. And obviously, being now a Matlow, um, be raising money for the Royal Navy and Royal Marines charity as well. What happens? Mm. Oh, no, 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 ignore that. Well, no, I was going to say what, because it, 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 the question's asked, asked already. <coughs> answered, answered already. What, I was going to say what happens, if a, what happens if a person who's responsible for doing one of the 16 mile legs mm. gets injured, and that they'd organise that replacement and blah, 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 blah. Um, that is interesting. I'm interested in being a part of that. So I would I will uh email you. It'd be great <laughs> to have you on board here. No. Yeah. I am interested in being mm. part of that. Um uh, uh, <laughs> to be brutally honest, only because it's not only, it's a charitable endeavour like that. Um I also think that um I don't know. Most of my exposure is to uh, organisations and charities who, who are military oriented, which I've got nothing against. But we're not the chosen ones. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm, I'd like yeah. to help a wider, mm. you know. So, and this is a this is an example of that. I can, mm. I can do both. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we chat chat offline? Mm. If, uh, you know, I'd be great. I, I'd like to do one of the six, 16 fucking hiccups. Mm. I'd like to do one of the sixteen my legs if possible. Oh yeah. Certainly. And. Um, Raise the money, be a be a part of it, and then I, and and in that selfish way, I can go. I was part of that thing. That's never been done before. Well, it's um if uh, if you go onto our website, which is www.yompathon.com, um, you'll have a look at the routes. Um, so the route cards are all done, and and the order of march. Um, so uh, the route, the march schedule, and it will ha it has ETAs, um, pretty much exactly where we're going to be at what time. Mega, mate. 
Mega. Why? Just because every now and then, Hugh, I like to uh, put something back. Um, I've, I think we've all, in, if you've, you've been in the military uh, or the emergency service for any length of time, um, you, we've, we've all seen people suffering from mental health or the result of it. Mental ill health. Yeah. So what, what we, we're certainly getting better in the military side of things, but you know, to the so sort of the lane man, if you like, when people say post-traumatic stress disorder, they think about the infantry soldier in an ealing unsupported position in a desert somewhere, you know, on tour, which yes, yes, that happens. But what they don't see is the A&E nurse that is smashing out 14 hour days, you know what I mean? On a COVID red ward. <clears throat> what they don't see is the firefighter <clears throat> on the M3 picking up body parts. You know, so there are a lot of these, and 33% of uh, the emergency services are made up of ex-military personnel. So, you know, it's uh, a lot of these people take these conditions into their new, new, new sort of service life with them. Yeah. Um, so, the the team have been selected so that it is not only tri service but it's also emergency yep. service. The trustees, um, we have four trustees on, on the Yompathon charity each from a different background um, so that no favoritism is given to army, Navy, air force, paramedics, whatever. Yeah. It's uh, <clears throat> the money goes into one pot and it is distributed evenly. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, I wanted the Yompathon to be um, a charity in its own right, purely because I didn't want, um, y you know, uh, the, the, the eight charities that we're currently doing the Yompathon for, um, may change in the future, depending on which direction that we want to support in. But at, at the moment, the Yompathon event um, is the promotion event for the new charity, Yompathon. <coughs> no, I like it. Uh, it's good. It's a good point in the Unsung Heroes, you know. To be honest, I was quite naive. I'm mean, going to have to wrap this up in a minute, but I, I was quite naive in the... <laughs> experience experience sorry if this hiccups and hiccuping is annoying people um the experiences and arduous arduous events arduous emotional journeys that people can go through without ev ever being military or without mm. ever being on an operation or whatever mm. it's like you know uh, uh, well yeah um and it's uh, i only stopped being naive to it when a, fr uh, a very good friend, one of my best mates, I'd say, mm, yeah, one of my best, one of my best, I can't go back on that now. Yeah, one of my best mates. <laughs> Shit. Shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my best mates um, became a paramedic. Mm. And uh, after, after leaving the military, and I've heard him talk through his experience. I, I know he he did some he experienced sig significant things when he was serving. Mm. Um, and I and hearing him talk, th fuck hell, sorry, uh, hearing him talk through his experiences as a paramedic, and having him being able to contrast one against the other in terms mm. of careers, <laughs> jobs. Man, if I had a choice, if like if I've got two daughters, if my daughters came to me and said, uh, "Dad, what do you reckon, paramedic or or reg?" The girls mind, and I go, "Yeah, go for the reg, do it." Mm. <laughs> if you manage to get in, mega, you be the first girl, the first girl. But if they had a choice and they hints to me, "Dad, I've got a choice: uh, army, frontline military, or frontline NHS." I would say frontline military mm. all day long, mm. all day long, mm. because in the same way with firefighters, in the same way with police, they are dealing with, my God, the most stressful, draining events and experiences mm. every day. You and I had the luxury of only having to do that for limited periods of time mm. three four five six months in reality mm. they don't do that 
they have it every every single day every single day without fail we had the luxury of having a huge proportion of our military career being dedicated to training most of the for most people most of the time or at least half the time they do is spent training preparing for the events that's not the case mm. for the emergency services for the uniformed work you know that that blue light services or not even blue light but you know nhs police firefight all those that's not the case for them they've got minimal time for training minimum time for preparation they're in the, th in the thick end of it every single day every hour you don't know what's coming you know and uh i, I didn't have that perspective on it until relatively recently mm. last few years and i'm glad i have got it um and so you know bang on mate i'm on board with you on all the way 100 percent. i like I, it i was I really like fortunate it. hugh because when i was training to be a Royal Navy medic, um, our, we get a hospital attachment. So this was during COVID. Um, so I was working on a COVID red ward in Portsmouth. And, uh, you know, you really see how hard these people are working. I mean, I was going back every night ball bagged and I was doing half the shifts that the nurses were doing. And, you know, you see, you see people when, you know, it does get quite frustrating when you see these <coughs> anti-vaxxers and people like that. And uh, you, you, you say, oh, yeah, it's all... Uh, conspiracy uh, right get, get, get yourself on a covid red ward you got people over the age of 65 coming in with underlying health conditions they're going out in a body bag you know it's very real <coughs> yeah mm. very real and uh yeah seeing how hard these paramedics and nurses are working at the moment wow wow yeah yeah it's been a pleasure mate it's been a pleasure it's decent um yobathon.com yeah. Yep. Yomthon.com. So um, have a look at the website. Um, it's got all our sponsors on there. Um, we're very fortunate. So uh, our sort of on the man kit we've got. Um, massive thanks to Bridgedale, the socks. So we're getting sponsored by uh, Bridgedale. Um, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So I have, the last time I was wearing Bridgedales was back when I last saw you. Yeah. Brilliant. 2001, Love it. I've got a pair on now. You got have a you? pair on now. Oh, Lovely. Are they still £9 a pair? Oh, the, the thing—the ones we got are like fourteen ninety-nine. Yeah, they're really decent. They're, they're the um, the the summits. <coughs> so uh, yeah, good. <laughs> massive thanks to Bridgedale for that. Um, Joe and Paul at Altberg. Altberg have sponsored us with are their really? elite tabbing boots, which are one hundred and eighty-five quid's worth of boot. Um, best boots I've had in my career. Um, yeah, I'm cutting around with them in the Royal Navy, and people, where's your steaming bats? And I'm like, no, these are much more comfy. Where's your what? Where's your what? Oh, steaming bats, the steel toe cap boots that you're supposed to have on. What did you call them? Steaming, steaming bats. bats. Yeah, most people in the Royal Navy will know what I'm talking about, but you know, for the non matlows among us, they they are literally the issued service boot that you get issued with your um, PCS personal clothing system. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, Yonkon.com, um, dude. Yeah. All good. Um, good luck with it. Jenna, um, let's definitely, talk yeah. now. I just hiccuped again. Mm. Let's talk now about um, involvement. If I can be, I will be. Yeah, so, sure. On the left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Can I name drop a couple more sponsors for you? No. Oh, okay. Of course you can. Yeah. So um, OptiVac, um, they are a probiotic. Um, they are very much like uh, Yakut uh, drinking yogurts. Yeah. Good for, for good gut, gut health. They are one of our sponsors, but they Opt just do it in the tablet Opt form. Opti. Uh, OptiBack. OptiBack. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, they they do a probiotic tablet. A tablet. Little, that's easier um, than the supplement. That's that you easier than take. the stupid bottle. If the people much better. Off. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we we've been uh, sponsored by them, which is, which is fantastic. Um, you know, we've got uh, we're still looking for vehicle sponsors at the moment, and everything was hinging on our um, our, our charity registration number before we approach the corporate sponsors. Um, but yeah, we we'll put you in touch with some people after this. Would be decent. Yeah, possibly. Be decent. Well, yeah. I'm not saying they'll come mm. on, but I'll, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, Warrior Strong uh, Coffee, Warrior Strong Fitness. Ed Hargreaves. So he is uh, making one, sure that seven. we stay uh, supplied with uh, caffeine <laughs> for the event. Uh, we have another company called um, Iron Warrior supplements which is done by uh thomas anderson thomas anderson 
Um, he is the number one drug-free bodybuilder in the UK at the moment, Polish gentleman, fantastic um, uh, guy. I met him at Litchfield when I was training to be a medic, and he was working. Did you say for Polish? Yeah, he's Polish. Yeah, Polish. Thomas Anderson. Yeah, that is not a Polish name. No, it's not. No. Okay. Yeah. Probably saying that wrong as well, like my surname. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but we've got. Um, we, we've got oh, is it? You, but is it Thomas T A T O M A S Z? Yes. There we go. There we so, are. Yeah, I, know, I knew a Polish Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, for but for, please have a look at the website. Um, look at our donations page is under construction, so that it will be in the next couple of weeks. We will have a donation page on. But the link to that will be on yonbathon.com. Yes, it will. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all, all oh, stupid hiccups, Jesus. Are all your sponsors on yonbathon.com? All the sponsors, all our patrons, all the beneficiaries. Perfect. Perfect. Mate, be a pleasure. Excellent. Anything else? Start next week. Yeah. And next. Happy days. That's it. Thank you for watching the H Hour podcast. If you're enjoying the podcast and you haven't already done so, please subscribe here, around about there. I'm hoping it's around about there where the button's going to appear, if not, if it's not already appeared. Uh, you can also, um, if you want to listen to the podcast, on your commute, for example, when you're driving, when it's not practical to watch the podcast, you can listen to it. It's on Spotify, it's on Apple Podcasts, it's on Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. It's on all of the uh, all of the common and not so common podcast apps. You can also, if you wish to do it, become a patron of H Hour. Becoming a patron of H Hour, you get access to all of the interviews before anyone else. So this interview with this guest was released days, if not weeks, before it was on release to the general public, and you also get access to. Uh, exclusive interviews which I do with each guest that last about five ten minutes that are based on questions that the patrons themselves of H Hour have chosen and each guest this one included gets asked those questions before the main podcast that's getting recorded it's like a pre-podcast interview lasts about 10 minutes and those interviews are really insightful really enjoyable nice and short and they only release the patrons they never get released to the public I don't know why I had a little stutter there um you also get access to a Discord community, exclusive Discord community only for patrons. You also get invited to a monthly Zoom call with myself and all the other patrons. And very often, most months, we have a previous podcast guest comes onto that Zoom call and has an exclusive Q&A with the patrons. In addition to this, there's monthly giveaways. We give away, give away gifts to my patron supporters. And it's all like, well, predominantly veteran-owned stuff. I'll go and buy veteran-owned apparel, veteran-owned product services, and I'll give them away to my patron supporters. And I'll also uh, do exclusive invites for events. So you'll get freebie tickets to events. To become a patron of Page Hour, go to patreon.com forward slash HK podcast. I'm spelling Patreon, P A T R E O N, patreon.com forward slash HK podcasts. Hit become a patron. And uh, I'll see you on the next Zoom, Q- Zoom QA if you do. Oh, you also get your name in the credits. Thanks for watching. I will catch you next time.